Okay, well, I just said 20 minutes um, went a little bit longer, but it went really fast. <laughs> so um, we'd like to welcome Paul Kazi, um, Parks and Conservation Resources. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, County Commissioners. Uh, thank you for allowing us to present this afternoon. So who we are, uh, Parks and Conservation Resources has 201 FTE, which is uh, just over 9% of the total county workforce, and it's divided up into six major divisions or program areas. Those are Parks and Environmental Lands, Resource and Asset Management, County Extension, Air Quality, Horticultural and Trade Services, and Business Services. And if I could, I'd like to... Uh, introduce my management staff. Uh, we have at the end, JP or Jeffrey Gellerman, who's the County <coughs> Extension Director. Spencer, yes, Spencer Curtis. <laughs> you know your Spencer name. Curtis and Lyle Fowler are the two operations managers that oversee uh, parks and environmental lands. Steve Harper is our resource and asset management manager. Jolanda Jordan is our department administrative manager, oversees business services. Jimmy Worcester oversees the horticultural and trade services. And Ajaya Satyal is our air quality local air program director. Just a note, we'll actually be um, losing AJ later this year. He is retiring uh, from the county, so we will certainly miss his contributions. So what we do, the department operates and maintains over 20,000 acres of natural areas throughout the <coughs> county from Brooker Creek and Howard Park in the north to Fort DeSoto Park at the south end of the county. The air quality division provides daily air monitoring of the air quality index, provides permitting and inspection programs and complaint response for air quality issues. We also provide public education through our partnership with County Extension, which is a University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences program. Um, and we provide assistance in areas such as sustainability, food and nutrition sciences, and natural resources. We also provide educational and interpretive programs on cultural, natural, and the archaeological history of Pinellas County through Heritage Village. Weedon Island, and the Brooker Creek Educational Facilities. We also operate and maintain the Florida Botanical Gardens and Heritage Village with the support of our uh, volunteer organizations, our foundations, the Florida Botanical Garden Foundation, and the Pinellas County Historical Society. We also host over 300 special events, including road races, triathlons, tournaments, corporate picnics, historic reenactments, and festivals each year. Recently, we've had several park improvements, including the addition of two new inclusive playgrounds at John Chestnut and Boca Ciega Parks. These playgrounds qualify as national demonstration sites, which reflects their accessibility for children with physical, social, and cognitive disabilities. Now, I would like to say that they're open, but they're not quite open. They're putting on the finishing touches of the installation, and they should be open to the public, we expect, hopefully, at the end of this month. We also had uh, the North Bard Walk at Chestnut Park replaced in the past year, which included replacing the wooden decking with more sustainable and longer-lasting composite wood decking. And after a long wait, the ramp to the Wall Springs Observation Tower was also opened just before the July 4th holiday. <coughs> You'll see the picture of that lovely structure there in the lower right-hand corner. <laughs> and, <laughs> and finally, uh, Joe's Creek Greenway Park was renamed in honor of the late Raymond H. Neer Neary, who advocated tirelessly for the Lailman community. And speaking of Raymond H. Neary Community Park, a conceptual master plan for this community park in Lealman was also com completed last year. The park plan, which is expected to be completed in phases beginning this fiscal year, includes playgrounds, an adult fitness area, dog parks, open play fields, restrooms, enhanced landscaping, and renovated outdoor basketball courts. 
Uh, we also are planning an additional public meeting on the park plan Should for the community. Seat. Hold on just a second, um, Commissioner. Justice. Sure. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you. I just <coughs> wanted to uh, throw a little tidbit because it's one of the most uh, re remarked on things I hear about in Lelman is they, they love the concept of the park, but the large oval shape, they want a rectangle shape for more field play. Yes. And, and I'm sure you've heard it too. Yes. And we have heard that. <laughs> and that is why we are going to uh, hold another public meeting in Lelman. And we've talked to our consultants about that. But you're right. It's difficult to play soccer, football, or, or something like that on an oval field. And Commissioner Long also. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. And I would be remiss, and I'm sure Ray would be mad, if I didn't mention that I never had a conversation with him when he didn't ask how long it was going to be before the county put in a swimming pool. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> and, and we would all know the answer to that if someone had the answer to that, but I have no, no knowledge of any plans other than the swimming pool that the county contributed to in Palm Harbor, uh, the YMCA pool. So I guess that would be the swimming but that's pool. that's what he wanted. There's, there's been more talk about a splash pad similar to what's at Dell Holmes Park in South St. Petersburg versus an actual swimming pool. Yeah, I mean, who would operate a swimming pool? That's where you. I don't know. And therein lies that's the rub. That's what he wanted. I mean, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So, are we working on the splash pad then? <laughs> I'm just asking because there, there are. That's part of the conceptual plan was for some type of water feature. Yes. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> some sure. kind of water feature. <laughs> since, since, we, since we dove into that, I'm, I'm being Mark Water today. So what? Dove in. I was trying to be Mark Woodard. Uh, uh, oh, I thought you said Mark Puente. No, I, I absolutely <laughs> did not say that. Um, so where would the splash pad go on here? Can you point to the area? That's good. Um, yes, I guess I'm going to need the... Uh, here you go. <clears throat> right in this area. What's that? And the Dell Homes is a great feature folks use that all the time and love it yeah. um it's not a pool though no it's and, definitely not a pool and the argument from ray um was this is a large it's like a like a food desert but it's a recreation desert you know where's the closest swimming opportunity you know for kids in that area and you know as we look at poverty reduction and that's that's an issue um, kids learn to swim at a at a young age, so they have that skill going up. So, I'm still concerned about if we don't do it here, where where is it available in the community? Now, Northeast High is down the road, but you know, getting access to a school facility has been a problem. So, I'm and to still, that, and I'm to still that concerned point, about where we do it if it's not here. And to that Who point, uh, it wasn't lost on me in a really serious conversation that Ray and I had about how many children grow up in Leoman. They go to school there. If they if they go to college, they come back and they relocate in Leoman, and they have never ever been to the beach. So the issue of you know safety for kids, you know that drowning issue is huge not only here but across our state. I don't know where we talk about that if it isn't here. Well, I, well. I know that the administrator <coughs> is planning to schedule a workshop on recreation in the unincorporated areas. Okay, so I think probably when, when we do that presentation would probably be the ideal time to discuss those issues. Good. But I, uh, to get ahead of that curve, I think we should... Um, you know, initiate a conversation back with the school board about joint use facilities agreements. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very possible we could get the Y or somebody else to teach swim lessons at um, Northeast High School, I mean, and make it available. So um, pools are extremely expensive yes, to operate. Yep. And unless we could find a partner who might want to you know, have us put the capital in, but they would do the ongoing O and M just like they did at the Y and High Point as well. Um, well I think so. a perfect example is y'all know I went on this motorcycle venture uh, a year and a half ago. I took my lessons at Northeast High 
on their driving range. Right. They leased it out to the Harley Davidson dealership on the weekends. And every weekend, you know, folks are there learning how to ride motorcycles there. I mean, why can you do that for the pool? I would think you we know, would be able to. You know, with the private sector, certainly a mm-hmm. public partner sh- should seem to work on that. And, and just so you know, the Lelman Family Center, which most of us were at the lunch the other day, uh, during the summer, in their summer camp programs, usually one day a week is at the pool. And I think they rotate, but I think they go to Fossil Park um, wow. pool where they have a day. So there's some swimming going on. Good. But just in preparation for that meeting, you'll probably could reopen some discussions perhaps with the schools as right. well as um, the cities or, you know, to see what our possibilities might sure. be and maybe talk to some not-for-profits that provide recreation mm-hmm. in that general vicinity. Commissioner Gerard? Yeah, and I would prefer to have a partnership like that where somebody else is doing the pool than us doing it ourselves. I know if you talk to... Um, Joan Byrne at Largo, she would tell you she <laughs> wants to get rid of the one pool that she has. Just that they're incredibly expensive. And liability. And the liability and all the lifeguards you have to have all the time. And yeah. And the splash pad is an incredibly popular. I mean, it's packed all summer long. So yeah, something just occurred to me, and it wouldn't necessarily help <coughs> the Lillman area, or maybe it would. So we hire lifeguards on our beaches. We, we do, yes. Had we ever consider having um, swim classes on the beaches? Well, the, the issue that we deal with, and, and it's one of the issues that anyone who's operating a pool, it's even more difficult for us, is because the lifeguards, our requirements for lifeguards require them to be over 18 years of age. Most of them are going to and from college. They come home from the summer, we get them. We don't get them until late in the year and they've all got to leave early. So in order for us to sufficiently staff even the, the positions we have, we're pretty much hiring all summer long. Um, and trying to find, while there may be opportunities, trying to find those opportunities and still being able to take care of our first requirement is to make sure that the people actually in the water are safe. It's real difficult. Did, you may have mentioned it before, or it's something I've heard, but my understanding is there are fewer and fewer um, lifeguards available because they're not taking the proper training, and they're just it's just not um, a career path in, for most. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's these last four to seven years, if it gets tougher every year. Okay. And so we, we're, we're probably going to have to look at reducing, like for instance, at Fort DeSoto, rather than have three beaches guarded, it may be only two, and just let people know that the least attended beach, East Beach, isn't going to be guarded. But if you want to be in a guarded beach, you go to North Beach or the... Um, the main pavilion area. And do most of the um, lifeguards still go through Red Cross training, or who does the actual training and certification? We do, we're, we're USLA certified, so um, okay. they can go through the different programs, and then they're required to come to us and complete a fitness test um, that shows that they've got the um, all of the skills that are required. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else? Okay, uh, next Heritage Village welcomed the history of sheriffing in Pinellas County in November of 2018. It's still ongoing. Uh, the display, which was produced in conjunction with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, includes over 60 objects and photographs and chronicles the history of Pinellas County Sheriff's Office since its early beginnings in 1912. Resource management continues to be a focus of the department, including the mechanical, chemical, and manual removal of invasive plant material and the improvement of native habitat. Uh, Pictured is an example of this work, which is at uh, an eight-acre portion of the Pinewood Cultural Park. It shows that the removal of dense brush and invasive plant materials 
helps native flora and fauna flourish in our environmental lands. So how long did that take to clear that? Um, that was several weeks of work, I believe. Yes, yeah, several weeks of work. Um, overall, in 2018, we treated over 3,100 acres of land with both in-house and contracted staff and performed mechanical thinning on 265 acres at Brooker Creek Preserve. Question. Um, mm -hmm. Just real quick, if you don't mind, in the last few weeks, um, our office has had a few calls regarding um, some of the materials that we use in the parks, and um, and I'm I'm, sh I'm confident that we investigate all alternatives uh, that are maybe safer than others. Some are more effective than others, and then you try to find something probably. Maybe if you could talk just briefly to that process of, sh of selecting those herbicides or whatever. Sure, doing. and, and uh, one of the things I do want to mention first is that we all actually have an internal working group working right now with, with all of uh, the folks who are involved in chemical spraying, whether it be public works, uh, parks and conservation resources, um, you know, our environmental folks. Um, so uh, what this, what we're trying to put together is, is basically an integrated pest management program where we look at all the options available to us. And, you know, the big, the big issue right now is glyphosates. There's, there's a lot of controversy uh, surrounding glyphosates, which is commonly referred to as Roundup um, in the media. Um, and so when we're looking at the program, one of the things that we always keep in mind is, is that our goal is to spray the least amount necessary um, and to look at all other uh, available options, whether that be mechanical removal, uh, you know, we use prescribed fire in areas, and, and so really what it comes down to is doing, um, you know, a, an investigation of what is the cost, what's the effectiveness, and then going from there. Um, so we'll be going through that, but right now, um, you know, the one, the one chemical that, that you're seeing a lot in the news being glyphosate is still um, the most economical uh, there's still a lot of research that's being done. We work with the University of Florida. Um, there are some other chemicals on the market that we've looked at. Um, some of them six to eight times as expensive as glyphosate. Uh, but we're going to, um, you know, as new products come out in the market, uh, we'll, we take a look at those and, and then uh, evaluate it from there. Yeah, I just one the only comment I'd make on that is that we do have, we do have folks in our community that are very passionate about this um, and passionate about it being applied to our in our parks. Sure. So um, I would do everything I could to um, embrace that passion and un try to bring them into the conversation as opposed to having confrontive situations that aren't mm -hmm. that aren't uh, that aren't healthy to anybody. I think we can really p perhaps learn something. Um, I know in one instance, Safety Harbor has made a change to try a different product, and we'll see. I just keep, you know, monitor right. and, that and, and, and we see. Do. Yeah. We, we um, you know, um, there's a, a city down in, in Dade County that has uh, prohibited the use of glyphosates altogether. Martin County has looked at it, um, and there there's a bunch of other. Dunedin mm -hmm. has contacted me. We've got a lot of work that we've done just related to the glyphosate so I know it's coming to the forefront right. on everything and certainly we want to be there to be able to look at these things and, and look at doing things obviously for the safety of the public for the safety of our employees for the safety of our environment yeah that was the key piece there I think it was also about our employees being properly sure. equipped and we usually subcontract that out I think but, but the major but, the major stuff yeah, yes but but uh, anyway, there's some good people out there with some real passion about it, and I'd rather try to embrace them than to push them away. So thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Lung. Um, Paul, well, that glyphosate, is that the one that the bee people have such a problem with? Uh, that's triclopyr is oh, that, yeah, that. that we're, we're <laughs> dealing with, yes. Um, and so... We're working with the bee people. We're actually working not only with uh, uh, certain individuals right right now to address bee issues, but also um, the Pinellas Beekeepers Association will be meeting with 
Um, St. Pete College Seminole Campus okay. has a really large B program. Okay. Uh, we're going to be engaging them. So, um, the producer on that. Yeah, we we um, we're home to a lot the of apiaries in our park lands. Um, so we want the bees to be safe and healthy too. Thank you. Right. Now, I'm sure I'm going to make a quick comment. I think Commissioner Eggers brings up a real important point. And I remember getting the emails last year and surges on this issue. Um, who do we rely on to certify that these products are safe? Uh, we rely on U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So it's the U.S. government that we're right. relying every, on. Every chemical testing. we use, and there's very few, but every chemical we use comes with a material safety data sheet um, as far as how the applicator is expected to handle it, at what rates it needs to be applied, what any um, harmful effects associated with it might be. Uh, we also work with county extension, um, with the uh, University of Florida to look at alternatives um, and is to investigate US when someone says this chemical is or may be doing this, we, we want to know what the latest research is. So I think what sparked this last year was a lawsuit uh, that um, someone won. Oh, saying yes, that with the, with the, the, the gentleman who was using right. Roundup. Yes. So is, is the U.S. government kind of reassessing or re-looking at the safety given that lawsuit? It, um, I believe it, I know it goes up for reevaluation every few years. I know there's a lot of um, um, anticipation of what the next reevaluation of glyphosate in particular is going to be, and if anything changes um, with its classification. Um, I think right now it's listed as um, from the unlikely to be carcinogenic from the. Uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency. But don't quote me on that, but I think that's how they classify it. And the timing on that? Um, I can get back to you with that, make sure I give you the right information. Okay. You know, it does raise some concerns in the back of your mind if that person won that court case. You would hope it's based on some factual evidence. And, um, you know, we're relying on the federal government to certify and They've been known to change their minds uh, now and again. So, yes, and, and, and there's there's a number there's a number of agencies that all evaluate the use of glyphosates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Canadian Agricultural uh, Administration, people like that. So, not only does the <clears throat> USA EPA look at glyphosate, but all of these other countries. I think one of the issues that came up that you're referring to is World Health Organization has a different um, classification of glyphosate um, than the US EPA does. The US EPA has the same uh, classification or similar classification to what the uh, Canadian government does. So that's what makes it difficult to determine what you're really dealing with because you have different organizations saying different things. But, but you all are actively monitoring <coughs> yes. that issue. Yes. Okay. Cool. And, and one of the things to keep in mind, in, in the scheme of things, in, in a county the size of Pinellas, we are a very, very, very minute contributor to the, um, the amount of glyphosate that's mm. applied in our environment. Uh, you know, uh, you'll probably see more glyphosate go off the shelves in one weekend at the big box stores than, than what we use in a number of years. I'm just, you know, getting those emails last year and you sure. saw how passionate they were. You know, want to be able to say to someone using our parks that there's no risk. Right. And we're saying there's no risk because we're depending on the federal government. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just something we need to look at. I, I haven't bought Roundup since that, mm -hmm. since last year just because of that right. uncertainty. So, you know, I'm glad y'all are continuing to monitor that, but uh, I appreciate Commissioner Eggers bringing that yeah, up. Yeah, and just one follow-up to that is that you just made a comment that we, we are such a small user of it. So, you know, even if there's a product out there that is three times, four times, six times, 
if we're spending ten dollars a year on it, it's only going to be eighty dollars a year or sixty dollars. It still might be worth that. I'm not, I know those aren't the actual dollars, but it would be interesting to know what we're spending on it right now, and then what we would be spending as an alternative to just kind of take that question out of the air. It, mm -hmm. Again, just thank you. Right, and, and like I said, we'll we'll have a full report on that as we put all of this information together. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Paul. Welcome. Okay, in addition to um, land-based vegetation, uh, we also do, um, we, we were provided resources last year, beginning last year, to provide nuisance, the elimination of nuisance aquatic vege vegetation in our parks and environmental lands. Um, what you see here in the pre-treatment and post-treatment is uh, a water body at John Chestnut Park, um, which, as you can see, with all of that vegetation, prevented canoers and kayakers the ability to enjoy the park. And what you see after is the post-treatment, um, which allows people to enjoy our freshwater lakes and ponds. Uh, aquatic vegetation management activities were also completed at eight other park locations, including the Florida Botanical Gardens, Wall Springs, Lake Seminole, Eagle Lake, and Ridgecrest Parks. Paul, Madam Chair, may I? Um, where are we with the, maybe that might be a Kelly question, but do you know where we are with the dredge at Lake Seminole? That would be a Kelly question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Here comes Ron. Well, I think, I think uh, this gentleman <laughs> Raheem Harji, Assistant County Administrator. Um, we're actually in the prep phase of the, um, the staging area. We had a meeting with the contractor, I believe, this afternoon to get an updated schedule, which we'll share with uh, the rest of the commission. Excellent. Thank so, you. Cool. Thank you. As part of the department's asset management program and our CIP planning process, we also initiated a boat ramp condition assessment report through Cardinal Engineering to review the existing condition of the county's 70 boat ramp lanes and 40 floating dock structures. Uh, as you can see from the graph, while the majority of the floating docks are in good condition, there are numerous deficiencies that were found relating to boat ramps. Most of these deficiencies, including cracking of the concrete and erosion or drop-off issues at the end of the ramp. So those will be something that we'll be addressing in the next um, future CIP years. <coughs> in 2018, the department also acquired a new software for campground and picnic shelter reservations and our point-of-sale processes. We are currently completing our beta testing and user training and data migration. And while we had hoped to go live at the end of this month, we are going to err on the side of caution. We've got 10,000 uh, reservations that all have to be migrated from our existing system <laughs> into the new one. So we want to make sure that before we flip the switch that the right reservation is tied to the right mm -hmm reserver and they're on the right dates and everything like that. <laughs> is that all at Fort DeSoto or where, where are they? Uh, well, they're, they include not only the Fort DeSoto, most of them are campground reservations, um, but it also includes, um, while we don't have as significant an issue with or worry, our uh, park shelter, picnic shelter reservations as well. But um, yeah, it's the, it's the campground that we really don't mm -hmm. want to mess up. <laughs> That would be good. Yeah, we don't want to hear it. And yeah, we don't want to mess up either. Those calls go straight to the chair's office. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think so. <laughs> and she's not a camper. <laughs> I know people have their favorite spots. I know they do. But this, this cloud-based software um, is intended to assist in our one-stop shopping initiative and reduce our overall hardware and software support costs for the department. The Air Quality Division has completed replacing five manual air samplers for monitoring inhalable particulates and two volatile compound samplers with automated <clears throat> continuous monitoring instruments in fiscal year 18 and the first year, first quarter of this fiscal year. With the addition of these seven 
instruments, air quality now has a total of 20 continuous monitors in its 11 monitoring sites and has completed its goal to be 100% automated. <coughs> Criteria air pollutants are monitored at these sites around the clock to de demonstrate compliance with our national ambient air quality standards. Pinellas County continues to be in, in full compliance with these standards and best of all, the cost of all of these monitors were covered through an EPA grant. Mm. Which is approximately what is it showing? 000. Are we showing um, that we have pretty good air quality? Yes, for, so we're, we're blessed with very good air quality in, in Pinellas County. Um, uh, probably a lot of it has to do with our geography, um, mm -hmm. but all in all, we, we, um, we maintain above 95% uh, good air rate. Wow. In spite of the pollen, we don't we don't measure for pollen for <laughs> as a pollutant. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> in 2018, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, Parks and Conservation, and Extension partnered to complete the first phase of a Pinellas County ecotourism needs assessment. The assessment identified opportunities and challenges in developing and supporting an emerging. Pinellas County ecotourism industry. Results from group meetings indicate that outdoor tourism and recreation stakeholders believe there are opportunities to expand land and sea-based ecotourism in the county. So we're following this up with an, with an additional um, uh, supplemental report that the university is providing us on specific ways that we can assist um, the burgeoning ecotourism industry in Pinellas County. As far as microplastics outreach and education, our natural resources agent, Lara Miller, which you met at your retreat, I believe, um, is a regional coordinator for the statewide effort called the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project. This project is twofold. It involves outreach and education, as well as citizen science. Our natural resources agent has directly educated 850 members of the public with information on microplastics and the actions people can take to help reduce their contribution to microplastic pollution. Uh, additionally, we've partnered uh, with organizations such as Clearwater Marine Aquarium, Tampa Bay Watch, Nature's Academy, and St. Petersburg College to expand efforts to collect and analyze local water samples for the presence of microplastics. To date, we have collected and analyzed over 50 samples of those 95% have contained at least one piece of plastic per liter, highlighting the presence of microplastics right here in the Tampa Bay area. As far as doing things, construction on Wall Springs Coastal Additions 1 and 2 commenced in September 2018. This $3.5 million project includes the addition of 1.2 mile bike ped trail a picnic shelter, restroom facility, observation platform, nature trails, uh, repair of the seawall, and a renovated docking facility. The project, when completed, will provide visitors access to additional leisure activities, the county's natural environmental features, and outstanding views of the Gulf of Mexico. While the current schedule calls for completion in August of 2020, uh, based on the current construction progress, we hope to see um, it finished before then. We, we talked earlier about unincorporated recreation. Um, one of the things we're working on, the first phase of the unincorporated Seminole Youth Sports Facility Master Plan, the facility needs assessment was completed in late 2018. Uh, consultants are currently working to address feedback from our, pro our project partners, uh, Cross Bayou Little League, Seminole Junior Warhawks, and the Seminole Youth Athletic Association, and we'll be issuing a final report this summer. Uh, the goal of the project is to address current and future youth sports facility needs in the unincorporated Seminole community. Funding for this study, you may remember, was provided uh, through the BP settlement funds that the board made available. We will also be uh, beginning planning for an outdoor recreation facility within the High Point community. 
We're hoping to partner with the Pinellas County School Board and possibly a municipal, par a municipal partner to construct sports facilities on vacated school board property. And in an effort to increase our customer engagement, the department will be installing five kiosks at Whedon Island, Brooker Creek, Florida Botanical Gardens, Heritage Village, and Fort DeSoto Park to solicit feedback on visitor experiences and satisfactions, or satisfaction. Surveys are also being distributed through our call center, which handles over 3,500 inquiries per month. Um, and once again, Pinellas County Parks continued to be enjoyed by over 16 million visitors per year. And as I said earlier, our parks host over 340 special events each year. Air quality continues to exceed its internal goal of 70% to inspect asbestos renovation and demolition projects for which required notifications are received. Uh, the higher percent inspection goal ensures the safety of the citizens from exposure to, to asbestos and other environmental hazards. We received 488 notifications in fiscal year 18, but we also inspect non-notified projects. Those are when the inspectors are out doing their other work and they happen to see a dumpster in the parking lot and go back and say, hmm, demolition's going on. I wonder if they've I don't have this on my list. Um, so that's usually where we find the violations. Um, total of 36 violations were resolved this past year with consent orders. And in, in addition to asbestos inspection, air quality also inspects permitted and non-permitted sources of air pollution, offers compliance outreach and assistance, and investigates citizen complaints. Our compliance rate for source inspection is over 95%. So everyone's doing what they should be in that area. And you can see just to, to show you um, on that graph in front of you, the state requires us to t inspect 25%. Um, we have our own inspection rate internal of 70%. And you can see that generally we're, we're well above that. Um, the only times we even got close to 70% was when either we've not filled a staff position because of uncertainty in, in the uh, federal budget or we had someone leaving during a certain period of time. And that's all I have for you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Good presentation. Mr. Dreyer. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about how how your staff compares now to what it was before the recession? Because oh, I, I know that you guys took the biggest hits. Yeah, and it's difficult to compare. Well, I know it was a whole different time, to but oranges because the the department's made up a little differently than it was mm -hmm. back in say 2008, 2009. 2008, 2009, uh, culture, education, and leisure, as it was called then. Had, um, had parks, um, we had cultural affairs, we had extension, um, you know, we had the, the Pinewood Cultural Park. Um, today, we have what was left of what the Environmental Lands Group was when it was consolidated with parks, and we became parks and conservation resources, as well as the air quality um, yeah. Uh, division um, is also part of our group. So um, I know that when when we went through the cuts, uh, when we went through the reduction, uh, the bad years, um, that our staff was reduced by 56 percent. So. Right. Wow. And how much? Well, it's hard to say how much you've recovered since then, but right. But we have. You know, our, our folks, uh, we're fortunate to have a lot of folks who, um, you know, think they have the best offices in the county, not working in, in the outdoors at, uh, at our various parks, and uh, they do what they do because they love doing it. Oh, I have heard that from your staff, actually. <laughs> they do love their jobs. Um, and I guess part of my, the reason for my question is I've been also getting uh, communication from constituents about the environmental aspect of what we do, and the parks are so important. 
you know, we tend to think of them as just land out there, but they take a lot of management. And I'm just mm -hmm. want to put you on the spot and ask you, do you have what you need to properly manage the responsibility that you have? Because it is a lot. And it's, yeah, it is, it is a lot. It's just and, such and, a resource. You know, it really comes down to we establish a level of service that we can work with. Um, you know, we have things that need to get done. Um, and, and really what we deal with is maybe something that we'd like to be able to do every five years only gets done every eight years or, or something like that. But, you know, the biggest, the biggest indicator of what, whether we have enough resources is really going to come from the public. They're going to call you mm -hmm. when they're not happy with something. And if we're seeing the same calls over and over again related to the same issues, then you'll see me up here asking for more resources. But, um, you know, we, we have... We have a, enough resources to do the job we need to do with the supplies that we have to do them. Um, would we like to do more? Sure. Um, everyone would like to do more. Uh, but we also realize that, um, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a big cost to that. And, and I don't think we're seeing any major degradation of our of our facilities you know we're entering into a new penny so from that standpoint um, we're very hopeful well thank you Paul and thank you also to all of your staff as well for um, maintaining those 20,000 acres and I'm sorry Commissioner Akers yeah uh, thank you Paul for the presentation um, just I, I really like the conversation you're having about the ecotourism and uh, I'm assuming we have I know a lot of people who work closely with you from our municipalities and kind of putting that inventory together of what we have in this county for people right this very moment to come in and do that and how we can coordinate those activities for people that are coming. What, what they're looking to do, for instance, you're, you know, where we had our retreat last week. I mean, I just don't think many people even in our own county realize right. that we have Booker Creek and what it, how special it is. But just getting that inventory together and then being able to market that somehow to people who are looking for opportunities, the trail and how it connects so many things. And, so. and that's, that is part of this whole um, uh, project is not only uh, getting the people connected to the places, but also getting the providers of ecotourism opportunities, opportunities for other places to expand the types of activities that they're doing. So well, that, I, we got a chance to go to that Girl Scout, Girl Scout Park up there in Palm Harbor, uh, next next to our, oh, our, mm -hmm. our, our our park, and it was incredible and yes. beautiful facility. I didn't even know it was there, uh, but it's it's really nice. So many many more of those. And that recreation workshop that we're going to talk. Are we going to talk about other um, uh, school property opportunities for recreation? I mean, I, I I've spoken a couple of times about the Manning Street property. In Palm Harbor, I just want to make sure. Yeah, I, I think that's that's part of overall when, okay. when we look at recreation that we have to look at partnerships, whether it's with mm -hmm. the school board or municipalities and things like that. But mm -hmm. we will address that. Um, Commissioner, I guess to address your point in a little more detail, one of the things that, like Paul mentioned, when we have this workshop, it's also going to include a discussion on our role as us as parks and conservation resources in the recreation side of uh, what our customers are asking us for. And the way we do it right now, as you all know, I mean, we work with agencies and nonprofits to provide the service. Um, we rely on them to provide that service for the most part, and we partner with them on improvements that need to be done. But part of the discussion that we hope to have at the workshop is, is that the model we want to continue going down with? Is there a hybrid approach? Um, or do we swing the pendulum totally where we start taking this on as a full-time thing? This is more of a discussion we need to have, so we're hoping to flesh that okay. out when we need. Okay, and then, oh. Just had one point. I, <laughs> have I had one more. Okay. Yeah. Um, since you're both standing there, this last question. Thank you for that answer. Appreciate it. Um, really go to um, land acquisition. since. Your, your part of your group looks at land acquisition for different reasons, and your group looks for land acquisition. Are we, are we, 
Now, those efforts, um, I guess, working together, I see a lot of Actually, you know, harmony here. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had a meeting just yesterday internally to put a framework towards all of this because we buy land for many reasons, right? I mean, we might buy it for right away. We might buy it for environmental purposes, parks. So we're putting together as part of a workshop session that will also be coming to you similar to the recreation discussion. It will be structured on here's what we do right now, here's how the different buckets are, and here's how they talk to each other. Because um, we can't do this in isolation. The process to purchase land is, is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to make sure we've identified those particular parcels that we want to target. We have the funding programmed in to go target them. and then develop a process so that when opportunities come up, we jump on them quickly. Mm -hmm. So you'll be seeing that at the workshop session as well that's coming up. Well, I wouldn't, I, I mean, I would say that purchasing land is easy, but um, well. I mean, to, to <laughs> Mr. Pupke back there probably would like, it's, it's not it's as easy, easy as you guys make it out. <laughs> Thank you. Easy for Thank us. you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Welch and then Commissioner Long. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. I'm glad I didn't get the look that you just got. Oh, I guess. So I've been Long. getting several. So I'm going to be short. <laughs> Mr. Long, um, impressed by your new reservation uh, software and wondering in terms of a new model, as Raheem just said, um, the $5 fee, the all cash, is there any hope to change that or change that process so that you're, you know, we've talked about this over the years, so you don't pay the toll and then have to stop there and pay with cash? Um, as far as like Fort DeSoto, Park are we speaking particularly mm -hmm. about? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that you know we we would like to do is to um, is to go to a cashless system, and of course that would involve um, either some type of RFID or or something like that. But the the issue where we get a lot of complaints is they have to stop a couple times first right. and pay the toll. And, you know, fortunately, they're going to Sun Pass and everything, so that'll be eliminated. But right now, um, we're looking at trying to first take our annual passes to the point where there is a lane, that additional lane there as you enter Fort DeSoto Park, that'll be an automated gate so they don't have to stop okay. at the booth. Now, that's not going to stop in, in the high season when there's lots and lots of folks coming in who've never been to Pinellas County right. before or only come here once or, or twice for a week in the in the spring that want to go see Fort DeSoto Park, but it is part of trying to modernize our systems. And there's no way to use SunPass or integrate with what FDOT's already doing? Yeah, we spoke with, it's probably been four or five years, Lyle? When, when we first were looking at this, we met with, um, with SunPass. We were really looking to see if we could um, actually just come in on their system. And, you know, it may be time to, to have that conversation again. Things, things have changed. It's been five years, six years. Yeah. So um, maybe they're not so opposed to that now. That was FDOT or the SunPass people? That was the F dot. Okay, and they've definitely changed leadership. So, yeah. I just think the user experience would be better if we could make that. Yeah. One oh, less yes. stop. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Wait, wait, no, well, no, oh, Commissioner Long still had questions. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. See, I don't like being down here. Nobody pays any attention. I just feel bad about holding Andrew up. That's all. So, I, my question I know. My, nice one, nice one. my question's very short, but in that workshop that you've talked about consistently, are we going to talk about golf courses? From the standpoint of golfing or from the standpoint no. of land acquisition? Either or. I don't know. It just seems like it ought to be a conversation at some place, some level. I'm going to let the assistant county administrator address that one. I can't punt to Andrew. Um, uh, yes. But a simple answer is yes. That'll be part of the discussion on what we look at. Um, so more to come at the meeting. Thank you. That's all I need to know.
think that was easy. Where's my button? Okay, very good. All right, thank you again. And um, next, um, last but not least for today is real estate management. And we'll welcome Andrew Pokey. Thank you. Hi. Appreciate the last but not least. Yeah, that's why I said it. <laughs> good afternoon, Andrew Pupke, real estate management director. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you today. Before I begin the presentation, I would like to introduce the department's senior leadership team, uh, beginning with Amantia Kempton, who is our new business relations manager, formerly our enterprise asset management program manager, Terry Hasbrook, our environmental programs coordinator, Keith Royster, the facility operations division manager, Brenda Ellers, our senior department administrative manager for financial and business support, John Neal, our assistant manager for fleet management, Sean Griffin, the Real Property Division Manager, and Kim Stracello, our new Star Center, Young Rainey Star Center Division Manager. <laughs> and these divisions make up the Real Estate Management Department, which is just about 156 uh, team members strong, representing approximately 7.3% of the county administrator's workforce. So in regards to what we do, we provide complete life cycle services for county-owned real estate buildings and vehicular assets. That includes the design and construction of vertical assets, the maintenance and operation of county-owned buildings, energy and water management, enterprise asset management, that financial and business support, fleet management, surplus property and donations, and under the real property and asset management preservation heading, we are responsible for sales and acquisitions as well as leases, leases and licenses, and for property rights, we are responsible for the petition to vacate process. Keeping with that what we do theme, we are also responsible for managing and maintaining, and that would be almost 4 million square feet of county-owned building space. That is exclusive of airport property, uh, also the utility plants and the parks department. We also have 271 leases, licenses, and other agreements we manage, which total over 180,000 square feet. Approximately 1,900 vehicles and other pieces of equipment in fleet management. 17 county fuel sites and 163 emergency generators, 121 of which are stationary and the balance of those are portable generators. The first project I'd like to highlight for you is the GL infrastructure building, which is part of the GL infrastructure upgrade project. This project was an $87.5 million project that began construction back in September of 2016. It was a 30-month construction schedule, so we are 29 months into a 30-month construction schedule. The project included the construction of a joint-use building for the Sheriff's Purchasing Warehouse, as well as the Facility Operations Division. That building is complete. We've also completed the Infrastructure Building, which is a three-story building it was storm rated as well as built above the flood level. This building has a central energy plant, new kitchen, new laundry facility, a data center and security control center. Also unique to this particular building is the cogeneration technology that's employed there. <coughs> and that is the, the ability for us to produce our own electricity through the use of a two megawatt natural gas generator that not only provides power for the building, but also the waste heat <clears throat> from the generator is used to power an absorption chiller, which provides chill water to a portion of the campus. And the waste heat is also used for heating the water in the infrastructure building. Quick, well, that, yes. Can I just ask a quick question on that? Certainly. Do we have an idea, and you can get it later if you need to, the cost avoidance by that technology that we're using? Absolutely. We did that analysis before we entered into the construction, so we can provide that to you. Thank you. Certainly. So last aspect of the project is the renovation of the South Division kitchen, and this particular renovation project involves mechanical, electrical, and plumbing upgrades, new ceilings, new flooring, and new kitchen equipment. And once the renovation is complete, this kitchen will serve as a backup to the kitchen in the infrastructure building. Next project to update you on is the Courts Consolidation Project at the County Justice Center. And this is phase one of two phases of the Courts Consolidation Project. This is a $56 million project, which is a design-build project. The scope of the work includes the building of a new courthouse annex, which will be the home of Unified Family Court and Court Administration, uh, the building of a new front entrance to the building, renovations to the existing H-Wing in the building, 
expansion and renovation of the jury assembly room on the first floor of the building, renovation of the clerk's second floor customer service area, the addition of public restrooms down at the west end of the building, and security upgrades throughout the building. Good news is we're uh, nearing the completion of the design phase for this particular project. We expect to have a guaranteed maximum price and 50% construction drawings from the contractor this week. Thereafter, we'll review that guaranteed maximum price and bring it back to the board for consideration and approval. <coughs> the contractor will then complete the construction documents and they will do, go through their permitting. We expect them to be in construction by early summer and this project is expected to last 30 months. So is this the a picture of the proposed new Correct. Front? Okay. That would be the new annex to the left and then the kind of gull wing structure to the front is the new front entrance. Front entrance. Yes. Okay. Next project to highlight is the Quartz Consolidation Project at the St. Petersburg Judicial Center. This is also a design build project. Uh, the budget is $11.3 million. The scope of work includes the renovation of floors 2, 3, and 4 in the building. Floors 1 and 5 were previously renovated. I'm sorry. Floors 1 and 5 were previously renovated. Uh, the scope of work for the three floors includes ADA upgrades to the courtrooms and the restrooms in the building, new lighting, new ceiling, uh, new finishes throughout, an upgraded fire alarm system, sprinkler system, a fire sprinkler system being added to the building, and the addition of a third elevator. This project is also in design. We expect to have 50% construction documents and a guaranteed maximum price in April or May of this year. And following that same scenario, bringing that GMP back to the board for your consideration and approval. Once approved and the, the documents are completed, the construction documents and permitting, the construction portion of the project will last 16 months. The next project, which Paul spoke about briefly in his presentation, is the North County Service Center Driving Course and Household Electronics and Chemical Collection Center. And as he mentioned, uh, this project has gone through design, permitting, and bidding. Uh, the contractor has been awarded the bid and is scheduling the work. The other part I wanted to highlight for you is the community engagement. We have been engaged with the community throughout this project uh, on a number of occasions. Their two main concerns were uh, visual and noise issues, which we believe we have addressed in the design through the planned installation of an eight-foot closed vinyl fence that will go around the southern and western borders of the property. And the neighbors, particularly in the mobile home park, have been made aware of the schedule for the upcoming construction. Okay. The next update is in regards to the Lemon Exchange, and in particular the leasing of the Lemon Exchange and capital improvement projects. Current tenants include the Broach School, Accelerated Teaching Services, and most recently the YMCA, which opened up a preschool there within the last month. We are also working with the Gulf Coast Legal Services for a tenancy in the two-story building on the second floor. In regards to the capital projects, we're getting ready to go into construction for the replacement of the locker room roof on the gymnasium and also the replacement of the HVAC equipment, which serves the entire gym as well as the associated classrooms attached to the gym. We are in design for the replacement of the HVAC equipment in the one-story classroom building and also in design for the installation of an emergency generator for the two-story classroom building. The next update I have for you is in regards to the STAR Center and based upon the board's direction last week, we are proceeding forward with restaffing of several cr critical positions at the center, including a facility manager and an electronic specialist. We previously filled the position of the building engineer, and as I mentioned a few moments ago, Kim Cercello has been promoted to the permanent division manager for the center. We will not fill all of the vacancies at the center. However, we will rely on some contracted services to take care of some of the other items rather than fill those positions currently. For CIP projects, we have projects planned out in FY19 and FY20. FY19 projects include HVAC air handler replacements. The FY20 projects include the replacement of the building's fire alarm system as well as recoding of several areas <clears throat> of the roof. In terms of economic development opportunities, we are looking at the west, excuse me, the eastern portion of the campus over near Belcher Road. That is the site of the, the former school. 
We do have, however, currently have a cooperative agreement with the sheriff's office for them to do active assailant training in that building. They made a request of us in which we've been able to satisfy. They'll be using that building for the balance of the calendar year, after which it is our intent to demolish that building and look for opportunities for economic development on that site. Uh, lastly, because again of the board's direction last week to retain the buildings, it is our intention to bring the buildings within the Enterprise Asset Management Program. Next update I have for you is in regards to the board's allocation of the BP settlement funds for two projects for which the Real Estate Management Department had responsibility. The first one is the Happy Workers Child Care Center. This was a $150,000 allocation which was used to renovate the former church building for offices for our club. Happy to report that that project has been completed. The second project is $350,000 allocation to the East Lake Community Library. $200,000 of those funds were used to uh, assist in the funding of the most recent uh, completion of the, build, the building addition to the library. The balance of those funds, $150,000, are going to be used for additional parking, uh, approximately 18 spaces, and that design has been done. The permitting has been done, and we're just waiting to get into construction for the additional parking. Andrew? Yes. Is that the parking just in front of the, um, the in the front of the property as opposed to the, the piece that they're considering uh, on the school property? Correct. Just in front of the building. Just in the front of the building. Yes, sir. That's what's being permitted now, and... It has been permitted, so we're just waiting to go into construction. Yeah. Certainly. Next project is the North Reddington Beach Fire Station, and this project is intended to improve the fire and EMS coverage for the beach communities. This is also a design-build project, and in addition to building the fire station, it is our intention as part of the overall project to replace and relocate a sanitary sewer lift station. We are currently working with the beach communities on the agreements necessary to uh, make the project go forward, which would include a land lease, a interlocal agreement, a building lease, and easements associated particularly with the lift station. Uh, in parallel with that, we are working with the purchasing department to solicit for a design-build firm to complete the project. The funding for the project is split between the utilities department. They will be paying for the lift station upgrade, which is approximately $2.3 million. The fire station building will be funded through penny four dollars and the county is contributing 80 percent of that uh, with the cities contributing approximately 20 percent. The overall cost will likely be somewhere between 2.2 and 2.4 million dollars for the fire station itself. Once the project is approved we expect the design for that to take approximately six to eight months to complete with construction then taking approximately 12 to 14 months to complete. <coughs> The next update is the leasing of the 501 building. Since the last presentation last year, in this last fiscal year, we have leased out the 8th and ninth floor of the building to the Tampa Bay Innovation Center, uh, which means we have just a small amount of uh, vacant space in the building on the first floor, some space formerly utilized a long time back by human resources, and also the sidewalk facing space formerly used by the tax collector. Should be noted, however, that uh, the overall building space will be benefited by the court's consolidation project whereby all the court functions will eventually move out of that building giving the opportunity for future tenancy for other private tenants. The next update is the 126th Avenue landfill. This is a former construction debris landfill that has cheated to the county in the past and since the escheatment uh, we have been working on land reclamation for that project and I'm very happy to report that the reclamation work has been completed. We have received our redevelopment permitting from the state. So our next steps are to acquire an appraisal for the property and then ask the board to surplus and sale the property based upon a, a base bid which will be based upon the appraisal for the property. Dang. <laughs> the next project is the uh, New South County Service Center. Went one, one too far. Next is the North County, excuse me, the South County Service Center. And it is the new location for the property appraiser and tax collector. That'll include an on-site driving course. Uh, this project is a 
uh, build the suit, as you may recall, uh, with a developer. We are currently in the design phase of the project. We expect to be completed in design by May of this year, after which the project will go into construction. We expect construction for this project to last approximately 10 months. So we expect to be in the building by uh, mid-spring of next year. Once we uh, occupy the building as tenants, we have the ability after a year of tenancy to consider purchasing the building from the developer for a designated uh, cost, which was previously identified and agreed to, which is $10.1 million. So, Madam Chair? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Adam, what the, um, where is that located? This particular property is at 2500 34th Street North, so just north of 22nd Avenue North on 34th Street. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Dresses. So I would assume that uh, we're looking at mid-2020. That's also when the vacancy on 66th Street, that would kind of all happen at the same time? or A portion of the vacancy on 66th Street, the tax collector and property appraiser will move out. Traffic court has already moved out, but the clerk is maintaining a presence there. We're working cooperatively with the clerk to move some of the staff out of the county justice center to allow for uh, an easier project transition at that location because, again, the clerk's area at the county justice center will be affected. So he's moved some folks into the South County Service Center. So they will be the only uh, entity, county entity, in the building after the tax collector and property appraiser move out. And as part of our agreement, the developer has the option of leasing the vacant space uh, but we have a lease that takes us through the time that the courts consolidation projects would be completed so we have no jeopardy of not being able to stay there so there's potential that we'll still have a presence there until how, how long on the calendar are we looking at potentially the, the 30 months it'll take for the work to com be completed at the county justice center okay thank you yes Certainly. commissioner welch thank you madam chair has uh, mr thomas uh, move forward on a decision on the 62nd Avenue South office? Not to my knowledge, sir, no. Okay. Last item which you heard about again at the last board meeting is in regards to the Duke Energy Park and Plug Program for electric vehicle charging stations. And I just wanted to give you a little bit more information, make sure that you were clear that this is a program whereby Duke Energy is installing, maintaining, and repairing these uh, charging stations for a period of four years. And the citizens as well as county employees will have the ability to utilize the stations through the use of a cell phone app. We did make a, we have an understanding or an agreement with Duke that county vehicles would not uh, be charged for that. And again, we might have, uh, I do believe we spoke last time about the possibility of charging the general public for that. And that's one of two options that Duke has available to us. I don't know if you have any questions about the locations. We talked briefly about those the last time we were together. Yep, where are they? Commissioner West. What are they? So we have the uh, 545 Courthouse in St. Petersburg. We have the Public Safety Campus, the Lemon Exchange, and the Cooperative Extension are the four that have been confirmed. Duke Energy did reserve the right to wait until we signed the site host agreement to do further analysis on the other five sites, which include the County Justice Center, <clears throat> Fort DeSoto, Whedon Island, Sand Key, and Brooker Creek Preserve. So we'll see once they do further analysis and we have the ability to put the EV charging stations at those locations. So there are charging stations around different municipalities. Are they all... Um, pay to play or are some of those free? Some of them are free. Um, the ones in St. Pete, for example, are those? I think that, that I don't know. If it's in St. Pete, I can certainly find that out for you. But Okay. I, I was just, um, well, it makes sense. Somebody's got to pay for it, but right. the pay to play option, how do we come to that decision? How do we come to that decision? Mm -hmm. uh, it's really not a decision yet to be made. Uh, the county administrators ask for us to do some. So it might it might be free or it might be correct. Okay. Yes, sir. We haven't made that that decision yet. I don't think we have to get to that point. It's it's an either or option, and, and by execution of the site host agreement, did not uh, ne necessarily require us to pick one of the choices. Could you? Um, I'm interested for the cities that have the free free to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, is the city picking that up, or is Duke picking up the cost? No, the city would be picking the up. The picking is it not up. picking it up. Duke is not? Correct. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it'd be nice. It was a good question to ask. Public service. Hmm. Yeah. 
Thank you. Commissioner You're welcome. Thank you. What what uh, number or amount percentage? What part of our fleet is actually electric that will be using these kind of charging stations? Uh, I would say less than five right now. Uh, most of those are within uh, solid waste, and that's because they have existing charging stations. Uh, but there is consideration to look at that. We have uh, very few passenger vehicles within the fleet. I think we've talked about that before. Yes, sir. Uh, but we can identify those vehicles that would be applicable for electric vehicles and also where they're at in the vehicle replacement plan to make a determination as to which ones we would want to consider for that. Again, having the infrastructure in the appropriate locations is imperative so that uh, if it's at the work location, that's great, but if they have to go somewhere else, uh, as you heard from the Duke representative, unless it's a fast charging system, then the ones that we're talking about, the level twos, would take some time for charging to occur. But it is something we are looking at. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Commissioner Aker. Hi. Thank you, Andrew, again. Um, so I'm just amazed about how many square feet that we have, that we own. You said over 4 million? Almost 4 million, yes, sir. Of building. Correct. Of facilities. Yes. Is there a map that shows little red dots like where all these facilities are located? I mean, is there something like that available? I'd just be curious to see how yes. how widespread that is. And anyway, we have um, to provide that to you. And if you could like like let Duke Energy know that there is a North County for charging stations, that would be nice. Other than to have one in Booker Creek, there's other areas that would be very happy to accommodate. I'm sure. Okay. Um, um, and then. Um, what, what's the plan for the building across the street, you know, where the planning group is? Let me get turned around right over here, I guess, the planning facility and MPF for Pinellas. Is that, is that going to, is, is for Pinellas staying there, or is that, is, that in, is that being thought through right now? Yeah, I would say it's the latter where it's being thought okay. through right now. We've okay. had conversations with Forward Pinellas and, and also conversations with planning about their need for space and the desire for some shuffling of county departments. but. Uh, at present, we don't have a location necessarily for Forward Pinellas. And uh, my understanding is the county administrator wanted to have some further conversations okay. with both of those entities before making a decision. Okay. And maybe it's the same on the, the, the joint government building discussions with Clearwater. Is, what's the status on what's the latest? status latest? is we have a purchase order for the feasibility study. Uh, okay. We'll be meeting with both PSDA and the city of Clearwater next week to kind of kick that study off Great. and then 60 days from uh, that commencement, we should have a report for you. Okay, thanks. You're certainly welcome. Okay, anyone else? Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Again, thank you to all your staff and uh, for taking the Star Center back on too. Appreciate it. Okay, is there anything else um, to come before the board today? And we finished. Five minutes. Two. Okay. Two. All right. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Madam Chair.